Welcome to the Essence Scrum Podcast. I am your host, Raphael, and today we have a very, very special guest. It's Snure Huck from Thorns. Uh, Mr. Snure, thank you a lot for accepting our invite. Yeah, thank you too. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Okay, I hope uh, you're doing well there in, uh, in Norway, correct? That's where you are? Yeah, that's correct. Um, today I'm located in a cabin out on the coast. Uh, close to Hitra, the largest uh, island of Norway. Mm. I see straight over to Fusen, where Schlagmöhr is located. So um, we're on a, almost on historic ground. Uh, I guess there's a lot of uh, uh, battle traffic going in these fjords, and uh, sometimes we see submarines and warships out on uh, the coast there. And I've seen whales, and uh, there's a mm. lot of um, uh, fighter jets uh, flying over uh, because there's a jet base on the Fusen uh, where Schlagmer is located. And um, yeah, there's a lot of traffic going into Trondheim. And uh, um, yeah, this is kind of a sweet spot for seeing activities on the sea. Very interesting. Okay, so um, Snuri, you are considered one of the founders, right, of the style that we now call um, Norwegian black metal or modern black metal. And the, the whole scene surrounding this genre has been you know, thoroughly mythologized. There, there's been a lot of interest, uh, journalistic coverage, articles, uh, books, documentaries, even a recent movie. Um, so I think we're all interested in, in the backstory, right? About how did you guys, um, and you in particular, how did you uh, create these these unique styles? So, um, so what were what was it that was inspiring you at the time? What were what were your goals? What were you trying to do uh, at the time? Uh, well, when we started uh, um, getting uh, interested in music, it was always the more. Uh, uh, loud and noisy music that uh, kind of uh, was, had a shock value. Mm. Um, uh, we started out listening to like Wasp and Twisted Sister and Iron Maiden and all that stuff. Uh, we saw on uh, Sky Channel with Mick Wall and um, uh, what were the uh, Headbangers Ball was that a program? Uh, Monsters yeah. of Rock, stuff like that. And one day uh, we turned on that uh, channel and we saw the Combat Tour video with uh, uh, Venom Slayer and Exodus. And mm -hmm. that was like another level of uh, brutality. And uh, we instantly like uh, fell in love with it, not kind of musically, but uh, like uh, the shock effect of it. And um, we went down to the city center and found a record shop and found some of those uh, albums uh, and bought it like almost on a prank just to check it out. And uh, there was a lot of uh, satanic uh, imagery and uh, the titles were like totally way out there. and. Uh, we just thought that this would be fun to listen to, but we would maybe never like it. But um, it grew on us very fast and uh, we started loving that music. And also in um, that time period, uh, there were, were a lot of uh, people listening to like hard rock, um, like uh, Motley Crue and all that, uh, uh, glam rock. Uh, and uh, there were a lot of uh, young men uh, walking around with like long hair and uh, a little different style than we that w than we ended up with. Um, so we wanted to like give them the finger as well uh, mm. because we thought that was kind of silly uh, what they were listening to. So um, we developed more a uh, 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 rougher style with uh, long black hair uh, uh, and uh, only black clothes and all that. And so they were like uh, eyeing us. Uh, <laughs> they were giving us bad looks and uh, we were kind of differentiated from them um, by listening to one step uh, louder and more brutal music. So uh, uh, it 
was kind of uh, there were many of the the people who listened to all that uh, uh, more glammy metal genres, and we wanted to like uh, step out of uh, and be different than uh, they were. So we uh, listened to only more brutal music and uh, uh, kind of uh, developed our own gang. Um, and there was not too many of us in the start. Um, first, we like uh, on the in the suburbs where I lived, uh, we were like three or four guys who started listening to this. And uh, we got to know some people in some other suburbs, and then we got to know people in other cities. And uh, I don't uh, know any number on it, but um, there were not too many. And uh, we got in contact with uh, people like Mayhem uh, and uh, Mortem, uh, the Dark Throne. People started to do more black metal music. And uh, it kind of developed over time into a, a community that was like spread all over Norway. So uh, we had the tape trading going uh, to send each other music. And uh, we copied the demos from all over the world and started to, to share. Um, and used the postal service a lot for this. Uh, Today we have the internet, but things were not that uh, simple back then. So we used the postal service and uh, um, sent each other tapes uh, with uh, new music, uh, demos that we got from the other side of the world and so on. So uh, there were a lot of young uh, people that were really interested in this uh, next step hard music. Uh, that uh, kind of found each other and uh, we started to like uh, write each other letters and uh, visit each other uh, sometimes all, uh, also. So uh, yeah, this was, <laughs> that was uh, how it looked in the start. Um, and more and more bands came about and started uh, playing this kind of music as well. And after some years, uh, uh, with uh, maybe Mayhem as the main uh, contributor to the scene um, and like a hotspot for this. Uh, um, a lot of bands like grew up with them as like, uh, not idols maybe, but uh, like... Uh, the main reference. Yeah, yeah, they were a big reference in the start and they also were good at uh, distributing uh, music and uh, keeping the scene alive. Mm -hmm. a very, very interesting to have this uh, testimony. Um, I find it curious that you mentioned um, the aspect of the brutality or the shock value. Yeah. But I think uh, black metal has a, a whole other dimension, right? Uh, yeah. Almost a mystical uh, dimension. and. Uh, I find it interesting in the beginning we were talking about the, the nature in Norway, specifically where you are. So yeah. I wanted to ask if uh, if you think there was an influence uh, also on um, on the the Nordic uh, the Norwegian nature. So this this very glacial, very dark uh, uh, environment. Do you think that influenced how the music turned out? Yeah, I think so. Um, and of course. Uh... It's uh, the winters in Norway, and uh, it's it lasts half the year. It feels like, <laughs> and it's brutally cold, and um, uh, it's dark uh, um, in winter uh, up north. It's like dark all day. So uh, this and um, and the nature, of course, um, which can be like uh, mountainy and uh, a lot of woods and uh, sea and all this. Uh, Closeness to nature has been a, like a great influence on the music, and also on the um, uh, spirit of the um, performers. So I think uh, it's uh, it's a part of it. It's not mm -hmm. uh, the only part, but uh, it's one of the great influences of the, the writers of Norwegian black metal. It's like the nature here, and. Um, it can be like uh, wild, it can be cold, it can be silent, it can be all things. So 
Uh, also, I discussed this with a lot of other performers as well, that uh, um, uh, yeah, the nature uh, as an aspect of inspiration is uh, important. And also we tend to uh, try to uh, be a kind of um, a spiritual genre. Uh, we put a lot of uh, spirituality in the music. Uh, not that it has to have any religious aspects, but uh, like the spirituality of the nature here is kind of strong. So mm -hmm. we like to, to be influenced by it and to put it into the music. So uh for um for my part um thorns it's been like uh one one aspect one of the aspects of um uh, uh, influence and for inspiration um mm -hmm. but uh um uh, it's not the only one it's one of the big aspects for thorns it's also been a lot about uh, making uh, non-music or to to break apart from the musical uh, or the humanity of music and mm. to break away from the spirituality and to make music that's uh, more what do you say uh, sterile or uh, non-human and non-musical so um, but also, yeah, uh, the nature is one of the aspects, but not the only one. Mm -hmm. Sure. And still on this aspect of uh, nature and spirituality, as you were saying, um, there's, for example, in the in your early releases, there are tracks with titles such as Thule. So yeah. is there also an influence uh, of, you know, the, the whole cultural heritage of, um, of uh, Scandinavia, the, the more mythological <laughs> dimension? Yeah, uh, uh, for the first uh, demo tape, if we can call it that, uh, there was, the, for instance, the Tula uh, song where we tried to imagine uh, how it was in like pre-Viking, primitive uh, times when, um, when uh, um, when Thule was uh, kind of an uh, expression of uh, beyond north or as far north as you could get, like a mythical um, mm -hmm. reference that, uh, that uh, um, was named Thule. Uh, I also think that was the uh, name of an actual place, but I don't know exactly but it was like more a reference to to as far north or beyond as far north as uh, you could ever travel and uh, we tried to like capture some of the uh, pre-viking spirit uh, primitive uh, ideas of uh, this uh, this phenomena a phenomenon or or this um, a big yeah, um, uh, this name, um, what it meant, and uh, uh, the idea of going uh, beyond north uh, to a place that's so uh, wild and barren that uh, you can't even live there. Mm -hmm. And um, we tried to to recreate uh, or to create a song uh, that was like uh, capturing that spirit and. Uh, Actually, all the songs from the Grimmick tape had the lyrics. Uh, not a lot of people knew this, but uh, we also uh, rehearsed them with uh, Faust on dr drums and uh, um, uh, Marius from Mortem on vocals. So all the songs had lyrics and the uh, Tula song was uh, like um, it, uh, the uh, refrain uh, it was about uh, Hugin and Munin from uh, the ravens of uh, Odin that was like flying over Thule and uh, and uh, it uh, we tried to capture that barren cold uh, feeling and um, so that was one of the references uh, for that album now that demo uh, 
um, this idea of this place that's so cold and so far north that it's impossible to get to. Hmm. Well, very interesting that that uh, bit of information about the lyrical themes and especially the the ravens of Odin. I had no idea about about that, but very interesting and indeed it seems something very fitting to the general spirit yeah. of the music. And a- another thing that you said that caught my attention was when you spoke about trying to, uh, one of the other uh, elements, so to speak, about Lawrence being, trying to break away from the, the conventional current of music, trying to get into non-music. Yeah. So I imagine that you probably, maybe you had some influences that were not so much, uh, you know, the typical metal bands like uh, yeah, Adderley, but also some more experimental music. Was there anything in that sense that was... Uh, yeah, sure. Catching your attention? Um, yeah. Um... One thing was that we listened to a lot of different music, um, also like uh, experimental stuff, uh, synthesizer, uh, synthesizer music and uh, organ music and classical music, orchestral music, uh, even popular music, all kinds of music. And uh, my idea still is to steal from where I can and take uh, elements that works uh, from where I can and like uh, implement them into my own music and uh, uh, use them successfully in my own music. So there's no like limits uh, to what you can use. Also, uh, important point is that we tried not to be influenced by music, especially the music that we um, listened a lot to, like, um, of course, we were influenced by metal, but we tried not to sound like any other band, we tried to like make our own music and um, make music that didn't sounded like anything uh, anyone had heard before. So it was a big um, point, especially for Thorns. And I discussed this also with uh, other people I worked with that uh, it's good to like step out of uh, time and space in a way and to try to like uh, find new building blocks for making um, our own music. So um, uh, I think it's uh, important uh, part is not to get too influenced by other music. But of course, uh, there's always a lot of good stuff to to learn from or to steal or to to use that can make uh, our own music better and more effective and um, uh we have no shame in that <laughs> it's uh i think it's uh, uh if i find something in gospel that i think work i use it if i find something in um, pop music i use it if i find something in rock or some other genre that sure. perf- preferably i hate uh that's the that's the biggest catch if you can uh, ho- hoist something out of uh something you don't even like that you can make into something you love that's that's the biggest catch so um i always try to to find new new methods of uh, creating songs and uh, new new building pieces um, and also i have this idea that uh, uh, not two songs should sound alike they should like be their own they should have their own identity and um, and uh, if not you'll just repeat yourself and get boring fast so that's always been a big um, uh, theme in my music making so and uh, j- just for reference um do you remember uh, like any of the those bands or artists that um, at that time were were influential to this more experimental side of, of Thorns? Yeah, I can um, list the ones that I listened to a lot and it was like uh, in the orchestral music, it was like uh, Chopin and Debussy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, of course, we listened to all the main ones as well, but uh, especially the ones that like uh, were more modern and had a wider um, range of uh, aesthetics and uh, we listen to organ music especially um, um, Oliver Messian uh, which had his own 
uh, modes, uh, scales, uh, which sounded uh, really like um, um, out of this world, ethereal, um, and uh, the synthesizer music of uh, of uh, Klaus Schulze and uh, Tangerine Dream and more like um, yeah experimental music in general and maybe uh, music from other parts of the world like Arabian or uh, Indian uh, music uh, uh, yeah I'm th trying to think if there were more like important stuff there I think uh, the organ music was special because uh, yeah it has no uh, rhythmic elements apart from the rhythms in the melodies mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the reverb of it and the mightiness of the, um, the organ itself. Um, that was interesting and um, composers like Messiaen who like developed his own scales and stuff that sounded like out of this world were really important. Uh, I've stolen a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yeah, uh, the synthesizer, uh, synthesizer music of um, of uh, like uh, pre pre Kraftwerk maybe, uh, but mm -hmm. also like Kraftwerk and um, and uh, synthesizer music in general because of the the um, uh, sounds, uh, all the special sounds you can make with mm -hmm. a synthesizer. Uh, it's really interesting um, and uh, yeah, uh, orchestral music and uh, yeah, music from uh, all over the world that like does different melodic uh, com combinations and uh, makes uh, outputs different mm -hmm. emotions. So, okay. So before we move on to, to the next topic, um, so still in these, these early days, um, as I was saying, the, the whole scene that developed around uh, your music uh, has generated a lot of interest, has become sort of uh, an internationally uh, known and, uh, and very interesting uh, scene. And um, so I think um, uh, and there's a lot of people interested in the background of what produced such music. So I wanted to ask you if, um, before we move on to the next thing, uh, I'm curious if there's any, uh, because uh, the community aspect must have been also interesting at that time, especially considering that you were so young. So uh, I'd like to ask if there is any specific, um, you know, stories or memories or anything you're fond of from that time. Yeah. Uh, or souls or... Yeah, I kind of, uh, I don't know if I can come up with any stories that I remember that stands out, maybe if, uh, if I think a little, but I think it was most important aspect um, back then was that we kind of made our own community with like um, mm -hmm. off beats uh, we were like um, uh, what do you call them uh, um, people that didn't really fit in uh, in any Outcast. way outcasts and off beats and um, uh, we like found each other and uh, made our own community and uh, we accepted uh, the different types of personalities that were were drawn towards yeah. this and it was all kinds of strange people <laughs> so um, um, it was kind of uh, interesting a lot uh, of an interesting uh, community to be in um, and it was uh, like also a little dangerous and uh, 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 we were pretty uh, on the side of like accepted uh, uh, norms uh, yeah the accepted norms and uh, we tried also to like uh, give the fingers up to the, the established community and we like to shock and to, to, to be different. So that also was interesting. So I guess there's a lot of good stories from that, but I can't come up with any right now. Um, I'll tell you if someone pops to mind. Okay. And um, still on these, um, on these aspects of the community and those early days, 
you, besides your work in Thorns, you also uh, participated in a very iconic album of that scene, which is the um, De Mysteries Dom Satanas by Mayhem. So is there anything you, you'd like to say about that, your participation and the, your contribution? Yeah, um, first of all, I like don't think I ever did anything musically. Uh, or, or like uh, what you call uh, instrumentally on that album. Uh, I gave uh, a couple of old Thorns riffs that I thought about throwing out to make new songs and I wanted to like just take the old Grimmick uh, area away and just toss it and start over again. So uh, Euronymous uh, wanted to use a couple of the riffs and I said to him, yeah, sure, uh, you can do that. And uh, he implemented them into uh, From the Dark Past. Um, there's a couple of riffs from the start there that also appear on the Grimmick demo. And uh, uh, apart from that, I, I used to play uh, some guitar with him um, on the back room of the Helvete store or where they lived at... Uh, uh, Krokstad, uh, when uh, Dead lived with uh, Mayhem and uh, we used to play some guitar together and uh, showed off different stuff that we made to each other and got influenced by each other and um, I think it's Hellhammer that says that uh, if it wasn't uh, for my playing style and influence uh, that the Mysterious album would be totally different. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the, my influence on and my uh, uh, participation on the, the Mysterious album is mainly on vocals, uh, not by singing, but by um, by kind of taking all the lyrics that Ted wrote and um, try to make them fit into the songs. Mm. Um, arranging them. Yeah, arranging them for uh, Attila when he came up. Um, to record that, I uh, I uh, went uh, and practiced with him, uh, and practiced with Mayhem with him on vocals, and tried to like uh, uh, figure out where to sing, where not to sing. Uh, try to rewrite the lyrics a little to make things fit together, and uh, and uh, that's uh, what I consider my main contribution to that album. Mm. And I did the cover art. <laughs> Oh really? Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, it's here. no. It's like um, uh, I used to take uh, photos from the newspaper, uh, and I um, kind of uh, hacked them with a uh, black pen and make the contrast really uh, mm. strong, like total black, total white. And uh, I used to do that with a lot of drawings. Uh, and um, I did that to the picture of the Nidarus Domen, which is the cathedral in Trondheim. And uh, when uh, Euronymous saw this uh, drawing I made, he said, like, this is the cover for the Mysterious <laughs> Doom Satanas. So... Um, uh, yeah, indeed, it fits very well. It's a very gothic cover. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, I, did, um, I did a brush up uh, together with a graphic designer in Trondheim. And um, she, it was in the early days of computers, so she did this on computer mm -hmm. to like get rid of some lines and some uh, blanco and uh, different stuff that I used and try to clean it up a little. And we sent it down on a digital diskette. Uh, but I think uh, maybe it got lost or something. So I don't know if it's actually my uh, version of it that's used on the cover, but uh, it was supposed to be. And uh, it's um, if it's not, it's a mimic of it. But I think they screwed up a little with the um, uh, formats, with the width and height formatting on the covers. I think the cover looks kind of yeah, not so good as it should have been. But um, I think it's like swearing in the church <laughs> uh, to say this because everyone kind of thinks this cover is like uh, really good. But I, for me, it's like uh, almost there, but not all the way. So, um, uh, yeah. 
that's, that's very one nice contribution that I made to the album. And I took the photos uh, mm. of the band uh, inside the booklet or in the cover. Uh, it was in Grighal where it was recorded. They had like really strong spotlights uh, from the roof. And I had a black and white film in my camera and I asked everyone to stand directly under the spotlight. So you got this uh, very hard contrast. Mm -hmm. And I took those photos. So uh, it all that uh, stuff was kind of inspired by the cartoons I read at the time. I didn't read a lot of cartoons, but I looked at the drawings because there were a lot of dramatic drawings in the cartoons then. And not cartoons, but like, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, they're cartoons. They're like uh, s a cartoon series for adults, like... Uh, like satirical, maybe. Yeah, Conan the Barbarian and uh, oh. like uh, more experimental cartoon albums with, uh, with like uh, adult content. Uh, mm. Not the pornographic, but the more violent stuff. Yeah. So um, at that time, there were a lot of like, uh, I think really good uh, artwork. Uh, so I was inspired by that and uh, uh, used a lot of strong contrasts in the things I drew or the photos I made and stuff like that. Mm. That's a very nice piece of, of information. Um... Yeah, because I think that album is a very unique uh, one and, and very a very powerful one. So it's always interesting to know the, the type of environment that produced it. As quickly as you pioneered this uh, black metal style, you also very quickly moved on to different territories. Uh, so the music that you later did, The Storms, is very, very different from uh, from the early recordings and from black metal in general. So can you tell us about this shift and what exactly triggered this move towards more um, more industrial types of sounds and stuff like that? Uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks for noticing. Uh, yeah, uh, like on the Grimmer tape, um, you know, first we were called Stigma Diabolicum. Mm -hmm. And uh, when uh, a lot of bands started to use like uh, Latin words and stuff and Latin names and um, Latin al aliases, uh, I thought like, okay, uh, this is getting too much, so this is getting lame, we have to move on. So we changed our name to Thorns, and uh, uh, the f in the stigma uh, times, we tried to make uh, evil music for kids, uh, like um, uh, childish music, but evil. Uh, and loud. And uh, in Thorns, we uh, did a little of the uh, Viking uh, music, and we did a little of uh, uh, referencing to fairy tales and uh, and uh, old children's stories. And we, uh, what else did we do? Um, we tried to move and do different things to have different inspirations for uh, stuff and. Um, when uh, we did uh, the songs that uh, were on uh, the Trunder Tune tape, it was like a little more like classical black metal, maybe. Um, and uh, for the Torrance versus Emperor uh, uh, split, uh, I tried to. Uh, implement some sounds from, from uh, computer games like uh, Quake and Doom and I stole a lot of elevator sounds and door sounds from mm. uh, those games and uh, used them as rhythmical elements in the music oh. and and also I uh, got one uh, a guy that were studying classical composition uh, to make um, um, like or orchestral uh, uh, or orchestral layer to much of it, and um, then uh, on the Thorns debut album, uh, I used more of like um, more samples, more industrial uh, samples and synthesizers, and uh, uh, had a lot of those elements in there. 
but still try to like make uh, new new songs, new uh, soundscapes, uh, and give the listener a different uh, feeling from song to song. Um, and uh, after that, it's been uh, very many years. So now we have gone a little back towards the uh, more old way of thinking that um, we use uh, a lot of tape, uh, like uh, cassette tape, and um, uh, we use instead of um, uh, like uh, digital uh, effect uh, processors and synthesizer for bass and uh, stuff like that, we use uh, real instruments with uh, with um, with real uh, amps and uh, record everything very analog. Uh, but still, uh, we have uh, worked a lot with uh, like old school analog synthesizer on this new album as well. So um, I think uh, the industrial feeling is not completely gone again, but uh, it's, I think it feels a little different now, uh, uh, sound wise. Um, but uh, for the coming album, there will be, um, for sure, uh, people will feel that it's still Thorns and uh, just more uh, better qualities on the recordings. Uh, but I like uh, kind of that uh, feeling of, uh, of uh, unprocessed, uh, like real, a really raw sound. So uh, we try to keep that uh, that aspect uh, alive still. So for the future, I don't know. Uh, but uh, for my uh, new projects, there's a lot of different things going on. But it will sound both dark and uh, and uh, hard and uh, kind of not primitive, but uh, but uh, not polished. I don't like it when things get too polished. And um, I think after the Mysteries came out, uh, a lot of bands started to try to sound very large, very symphonic. Um, and I kind of thought that, OK, this is what they want to do, but uh, um, I would have done it in a different way. And I started kind of like don't liking all this large sound, so I, I still like uh, the rawness of Death Crush, Mayhem's Death Crush, for instance, where like mm -hmm. there's uh, just two guitars, bass with fuss, and uh, very little EQing, very little effects. Uh, everything is dry and nasty. I like that. So I, I kind of. I'm the dude that uh, says always says that I I like the demos best. I like the demos best. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, uh, I often like the like more um, instant uh, stuff that uh, is recorded in simple ways, uh, and I think that's often sound better than things that are like uh, layered uh, a lot of times and. Uh, and polished, and uh, if you have these large sym symphonic uh, uh, sounds on top of it, it gets too soft, I think. So um, mm -hmm. I like it when it's a little uh, garage sound. Mm. Which is, was also part of, uh, if I understand correctly, that was, that was also part of the spirit of that uh, old black metal stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that was kind of one of the most important uh, aspects of me that it sounded raw, that it didn't sound polished. So um, when things got too produced, I thought it was kind of, it got a little boring for me. So I like to bring that back. Right. Um, I'm also glad you mentioned the split with Emperor because that's also a very, um very unique uh, recording that I bet no one was expecting it when it came out or expecting it to sound like that. So can you tell us a bit about like how that came about? Uh... Yeah, um, uh, it was uh, first I thought about like uh, 
after uh, I tried to get Thorns together, I tried to uh, make a band with Faust and Marius and uh, who else? I don't know if we had a second guitarist. We didn't. Uh, for a while there, uh, it was uh, the idea that Euronymous would play guitar in Thorns and uh, I would play second guitar in Mayhem, but uh, then I kind of um, we didn't get anywhere with Thorns. We didn't find a rehearsal place. Uh, it was only me who wrote the music and I felt uh, that I had to pull the whole wagon myself. So uh, I kind of just uh, thought that, okay, this I have some songs. I can just uh, move on to Mayhem and uh, bring my songs over there. Um, and uh, after the Mysterious, we can work uh, uh, with uh, my songs and make some new and we'll make a quick follow up, follow up on the mysteries but um, due to all the, the internal uh, uh, stuff that happened in mayhem it kind of lost my interest in that too so i just uh, moved from oslo back to trondheim and, uh, and kind of put thorns on ice and after some years i I thought that ah, okay, these metal things are uh, uh, too much hassle. It's too much drama, and it's uh, mm -hmm. uh, too much Falcon Crest uh, uh, soap opera stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, I kind of uh, lost interest, and uh, especially as I imagine that that time was when it was also getting a lot of media attention. Right? Yeah, it was a lot of media attention, and a lot of crime, and a lot of stupidity, and I didn't. Uh, uh, appreciate that. I appreciate that. So I thought, like, okay, uh, this metal stuff can uh, sell its own sea, and I can uh, uh, rid myself of all these ambitions uh, with metal and relax more and do more synthesizer music, which I did, um, and uh, kind of. Uh, I, I, well, uh, it was like in the mid 20s, uh, you kind of grow a little tired of all this aggression and you want to try out different things. So I was thinking about making more synthesizer music and not having high ambitions on uh, releasing stuff. And uh, until one day, um, uh, Sigurd Wundgraven, uh, who run uh, ran Moonfog uh, label, uh, he came to my door and uh, said, hey, Snurra, are uh, you still making music? And I said, yeah, I make synthesizer music, but I, I, I have no ambitions with anything. Yeah, but uh, what do you say if uh, I hook you up with some uh, gear and uh, um, uh, put some uh, money on you, I can um, help you get something together and it doesn't matter if it's synthesizer music or whatever you want to like uh, want to make i can uh, support you um just make music because uh, your music is cool anyway so uh he uh, kind of convinced me into uh, bringing my ambition level up uh, a little and i thought like oh, okay it would be cool if we could record those uh, songs um, that i made after uh, trundertun uh, including the trundertun songs and uh, record them properly um, uh, but i didn't have a band uh, it was just me so i talked to the emperor guys and uh, the idea first was that uh, they would like uh, 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 be the band and uh, I could uh, record uh, all my songs together with them and this idea developed into like uh, okay what if uh, you record my songs and I record some of your songs uh, on my uh, I had uh, bought a computer uh, for making music and I had uh, um, had a <laughs> old uh, drum uh, module and uh, I got uh, a guitar effect processor and some more gear and I had my synthesizers and I could like uh, make my interpretation of their music and they could like uh, record uh, the Thorns songs. So uh, it kind of developed into this Thorns versus Emperor uh, ID. And uh, 
uh, yeah, it became what it became. It's kind of a strange, uh, strange album that. Um, yes, yes, it is. I, I know uh, not of, a lot of people like it, uh, and uh, I'm glad we did that. Um, and uh, after that, uh, I kind of uh, got more um, uh, blood for it, and uh, I started writing uh, songs for uh, for the whole uh, debut album. Um, I was doing uh, animation school at the time. I remember that uh, I had some songs ready, and uh, Sigur uh, was on my neck to like get the whole album complete. I were programming uh, the drums in on the computer uh, and recording uh, the guitars on uh, the computer through an effect processor. I didn't have a proper amp or anything. I just had my guitar and uh, this uh, Boss GX700 uh, processor, which is really crappy, but uh, it kind of worked. And uh, I had um, Access Virus, uh, the first version of that one. Uh, and I programmed the bass lines and, uh, and I spent, uh, spent a month of the summer uh, vacation uh, back at uh, Volda where, where the, um, the animation school were at and there was like no people there. Everyone was at home. There was uh, the, the small town was like uh, empty and I was really alone and uh, uh, working on that album and um, uh, when I was like almost finished I went down to Oslo and uh, hooked up in uh, Mayhem's recording, uh, no Mayhem's rehearsal uh, space and uh, worked with Hellhammer to figure the drums out and uh, we kind of put the last song together there so it was like bits and pieces some of it but uh, we went into a really proper studio and had it uh, transferred from my computer into the studio computer and he recorded the drums and uh, uh, Sigurd and uh, Björn did the most vocals. I did one song um, and uh, yeah, it became a pretty good album. During that time when you uh were going back to music, um, were you keeping up with what was being produced at the time? Uh, like the newer music that was being made? Uh, were you getting any uh, renewed influence from newer acts or newer things that were being tried on music? I didn't. <laughs> I, I didn't pay any attention to, to other metal. I, hmm. I listened to different music. Uh, and uh, I don't know, lately I don't listen much to serious music at all i just listen to stupid uh, silly parody music so um it's a little from the spirit of like hacking or breaking music apart that uh, uh, i think uh, like most ordinary music is pretty boring and uh, i want to do something different and i don't listen too much to music also i had to have to say that uh, i never thought i would be a musician I thought like uh, either I become some sort of artist or uh, if I could do whatever I'd like to do, I would be a engineer maybe. Uh, but I didn't uh, ever have like um, the stamina or the concentration you need to do all the schoolwork. So um, I re I'm really interested in the world and world and I'm interested in physics and. Uh, I, uh, I thought like if uh, I, I if I succeeded, I would uh, rather be uh, like an engineer uh, that um, did uh, like technical construction or uh, uh, something like that. But uh, I never thought that uh, I would live for, from music. Uh, but um, uh, some years ago, I uh, kind of got the chance to step back from all of that and think like, okay, uh, I know this one thing uh, um, with music that I can use to like, uh, um, maybe get some income of. 
and also I've learned that uh, the things I've made um, are quite popular. Um, so uh, why not why not uh, spend some more time on making music instead of trying to do something else with my life? So I started uh, just a few years ago to take uh, my own music a little bit more serious. Uh, and I've, um, uh, I've done some more uh, music for uh, uh, TV, um, like the documentary of, uh, of the black metal scene in Norway, Helvete. Mm. Uh, uh, me and one uh, other um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, collaborator. Uh, we did that together, and uh, that was really fun to make uh, music mm. for for that. Also, uh, earlier we have uh, done a lot of music for uh, art exhibitions, more like synthesizer music and mm -hmm. things that uh, not connected with metal or rhythmic or uh, ordinary music at all, but more like soundscapes, and with done that in a surround format so we have uh, like five speakers uh, around in a room uh, pushing out uh, kind of uh, soundscapes at the people uh, first at people uh, looking at uh, the art of uh, Bjarne Melgård and Banks Violet uh, uh, Bjarne Melgård is a big Norwegian artist and uh, Banks Violet uh, had an exhibition at the Whitney Museum at in New York, uh, uh, and uh, after that we got uh, curated um, to have our own exhibition in Santa Fe, where it was just uh, our music uh, presented in a, in a dark room uh, with the cushions on the floor and uh, like a badass uh, surround system. So people could come into that room and just lie down and listen for hours. And we had a set up a generative system on a computer with a lot of layers, uh, making new combinations of soundscapes all the time. And it was really interesting. And that got really good reviews. And uh, after that, we did uh, a little, um, not as um, heavy but uh, interesting uh, exhibition in um, Limerick in Ireland uh, at a castle there where uh, we like had a, a surround system merging in with the natural environmental sounds so uh, we've done a lot of uh, like experimental uh, music as well so um, lately I've uh, started a new project with the uh, a drummer I work with in Torns, like Kenneth Kapsta, uh, which uh, he's more like a professional drummer, but uh, is uh, really good and has an interesting approach to things. Um, and we started during the COVID pandemic, where uh, when everyone was at home and bored, we started a new project that we just called Stigma. Uh, which uh, is more um, focused on uh, his uh, rhythmic uh, playing and uh, we use analog synthesizers and uh, guitars and uh, vocals in Norwegian uh, in um, more like uh, uh, singing in rhymes or like uh, limericks um, mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, pretty aggressive as well. So uh, I, I think that's uh, one of the most interesting things to do now. It's to to work with the Latin music, and uh, we signed up with Peaceville uh, for a release uh, with Stigma. So um, at the moment, I'm finishing up the new Thorns album. Uh, we're doing the vocals for it. Uh, and um, after that is done, I'll focus on the Stigma project and uh, uh, make uh, a kind of a weird album, um, which will re uh, be released on Peace Will. Um, and uh, apart from that, I have another side project with uh, 
uh, which is mostly um, a parody uh, on music in general and hip hop mm. uh, and rap music. So we'll uh, make That's some. That's unexpected. Uh, yeah, it will be really uh, dark and sinister as well, but it will uh, have uh, like strong heavy rhythms and uh, ugly synthesizers and uh, uh, a lot of silly lyrics. So. Um, uh, and then there's some uh, uh, score, some uh, music for uh, a film or a TV series. Uh, mm. And hopefully I can uh, step into the computer game uh, music. And uh, I hope to mm. maybe get to make some uh, music for games uh, uh, eventually. So uh, I. I stepped up uh, the synthesizer um, game by uh, getting rid of the digital synthesizers. And uh, uh, I uh, bought a Eurorack uh, collection of modules. I um, figured that uh, uh, you remember the old uh, patch boards, they used like Close Schultz and Tangerine Dream. I mm -hmm. thought of that was like, okay, this is. I don't know if I can do that, so I'll keep to my digital synths. But um, I learned quickly after getting to try to patch up an analog synth that it's much easier and much more uh, natural for me to work with the, the analog gear, and it's much more fun. So um, I really fell in lo love with that, and uh, I found that uh, it's really inspiring to have that kind of uh, freedom and to, to understand the, the patching uh, and mm -hmm. it's really creative. So I hope to use that a lot uh, in the future. Okay, and speaking of those more recent projects, uh, are you uh, generally interested in the world of uh, video games and, and films? Yeah, um, I, I don't watch a lot of films, but uh, I think it's really interesting to put uh, music to pictures like that and um, it's rewarding because uh, uh, when you like get a, a cut to, to put music on you like instantly uh, get an idea of what to make mm -hmm. and uh, if you have like the gear to make it and I do it's really quick to like come up with uh, stuff that uh, uh, affects the mood of the film and you get an instant uh, uh, reply from what you see and hear that if it fits or not and uh, always when I've sent uh, off this uh, music to the ones the cutters the editors of the films they're like yeah really good so it's um, it's been really fun to work with uh, with uh, with um, video um, Mm. to put uh, sound on the video also i did uh, animation school and made my own music and uh, my own sound effects and stuff like that and it's mm -hmm. really fun um, mm. because uh, for me music is like a psychological uh, and even f a physiological uh, uh, experience and uh, um, it uh, it really affects the way you uh, feel about what you see and um, uh, it has a very very strong impact uh, it's like hacking the brain hacking the emotions uh, mm. and you can like uh, put any kind of emotion onto any kind of picture but uh, when you work with a um, uh, logical development or uh, uh, into you or uh, uh, you want to get uh, a dramatic effect on the film it's uh, it's the most effective uh, tool um, mm -hmm. so so it's really interesting to work with and um, uh, I used to play uh, some computer games uh, all my life but uh, lately it hasn't been time much but uh, also um, it's very interesting to to work with uh, games 
Uh, also, I've been in very inspired by some uh, music from games um, yeah. back in uh, the 80s when we had like uh, Commodore 64s and stuff like that. Uh, there was one game in particular that uh, had uh, really creepy music. It, it was a game uh, like a adventure game where you uh, wrote what to do on the keyboard and uh, you got uh, a graphic picture of where you were at and uh, mm. and uh, it was really uh, high tech to have music on that as well and it was mm. just a computer chip inside the Commodore 64 we played like uh, gnarly uh, tunes but uh, there was a game called Castle of Terror uh, which was uh, about you came to a village and uh, there was a vamp vampire in the castle who has uh, kidnapped a girl and you uh, had to figure out a way to get into the castle and stuff like that and uh, the music on that was really creepy uh, so that was one of the big influences uh, I forgot to mention earlier was like computer game music uh, mm. interesting to check all these sources yeah. Uh, and speaking of uh, cinema as well, I know that some of the guys in the in the black metal scene in Norway they watch the gore horror movies. Um, I'm not sure if yeah, yeah. there was also an influence from cinema or in your case. Yeah, and if also yeah, we started watching like uh, when uh, there was uh, we had friends that has had collected all these uh, VHS copies of uh, like horror movies, splatter movies, gore movies and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, that was a big influence as well. Uh, the Italian ones, for instance, yeah. Uh, yeah. had really good music. Uh, also yeah. lately, uh, I've been uh, more and more interested in like spaghetti westerns, like Italian uh, western uh, movies, because the music in the yeah. yeah, they have great music and I want to learn to play that spaghetti stuff because they all also have a lot of <laughs> this uh, guitar picking stuff, like quick guitar picking, which is like equal to metal or thorns. Um, so I want to transfer my picking style from uh, distorted guitar to like more clean guitar yeah. and uh, learn this picking styles. But uh, there's also a lot of chord progressions that I'm not used to. So I have to kind of step up and learn this stuff. So that's one of my uh, current ambitions in music is to to learn uh, more spaghetti. Uh, I think this, uh, your, your work uh, doing music for, for installation and galleries is an interesting development. And in a sense, um, it makes, I think it makes sense because Back to when we were talking about the, the earliest Dorn's recordings and uh, the way you describe this, this idea of trying to, um, uh, with Julie, for example, trying to capture these or um, these, uh, and then the, the music in general has a, a certain ambience quality to it, yeah. uh, almost as if trying to, to capture a certain mood, a certain atmosphere. Uh, I think black metal in general seem, seems to have these, um, these aspects as well. So in a sense, it makes sense that you turn to to ambient later on yeah sure uh yeah i agree uh, it was um it's always been an element of uh, our music to like make atmospheres that put you in different places and you can't do that with only using the, the blues uh, scale <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> yeah uh, a short fun story about uh, Trendertune. It was uh, it was like a music school for uh, uh, it was um, not a course, but what you call it a line. Um, um, one of the, um, the, the the part of the school I was in was like uh, a rock and roll uh, uh, course, um, and okay. we. Uh, one time we uh, were like asked to go up on the stage and jam. Oh, jam. Yeah, and uh, I was called up on the stage. Snurja, get up on the stage, take your guitar and uh, plug in. We're going to jam blues. <laughs> blues. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I went up there and shook my head because I don't know the blues scale. 
I still oh. can't. I don't know how to play blues. Uh, so they they kind of uh, had a laugh at that, and I need to because uh, I couldn't play the blues. I still can't. I never like studied uh, rock music or blues music or anything. I just uh, made my own music and uh, used my own scales. So uh, that's the spirit. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so too. Because uh, if you want to make something new, you can't like. Yeah, you can uh, of course make new music by being educated in all kinds of music. But I never, never were edu educated. So uh, for me to play the blue scale was kind of uh, hilarious because I couldn't do it. <laughs> okay, and. Um... We've been uh, we've gone through more or less uh, all of the discography, the, the history of Thorns, and I was thinking when you when you were talking about your return and uh, this this sort of, sort of pressure from um, from Sigurd, right, and uh, yeah. the collaboration with uh, the Emperor guys. I imagine they were all big fans of your music. So uh, I wanted to ask if, um, but after after all these years, are you are you happy with the legacy of Thorns? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm very happy with it. I'm very grateful that people uh, appreciate uh, the music I made because sometimes I feel like I'm just um, a rabulist or uh, I, I just want to break things. I just want to to make even metal people angry at what I do. Um, I want to shock everyone. I want even the metal people. I have no like... Um, I feel no um, obligation to make uh, metal fans happy. I just want to to make everyone like uh, cringe mm. on what I do, and um, uh, I'm happy that people actually like <laughs> like what I make. Uh, so I'm very happy with that. Uh, the thing I'm not happy with is that I've uh, not been that productive. I, uh, I released one whole album. And I split with Emperor and a couple of demo tapes, and uh, uh, I wish I had uh, have had time and stamina to make more music. So uh, hopefully in the future I can uh, push out some more uh, more music, uh, so people can decide if I'm a hoax or if I'm a, a good musician, good composer. Um, but I think I'm kind of lucky that way that um, my taste in music uh, appeals to other people. And um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm uh, really grateful for that because uh, a lot of artists are struggling to get attention. And I feel like uh, I got my record uh, deal uh, delivered to me. Uh, I hadn't even made anything, but Sigurd came along and said like, Make whatever you want. I'll release it. Um, so uh, I'm kind of kind of luck lucky, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, you already dropped some hints so far, but um, in general, what can you tell us about the new material that you're recording for for Thorns? Yeah, it's um, I. <laughs> <laughs> it was recorded in 2008. <laughs> uh, the guitars and uh, bass and drums uh, were recorded in 2008. And uh, um, I, uh, Sigurd had uh, advice for me that I didn't listen to concerning the drum recordings. And um, we tuned the kick drums solo that uh, the um, shells uh we're like moving slowly back and forth it's so deep uh tuning on the on the kick drums and that resulted in uh when uh, kenneth plays the uh, the head of the the hammer of the kick drum uh, uh, lands on the shelf and on the shell uh, at very different times so we got a really problematic kick drum um, um, situation, which resulted in um, uh, a lot of editing and I had to do it myself 
because I wasn't happy with uh, how it was edited by other people. People were to to wanted to put it too much on grid, and I didn't like that. So I ended up editing all those million uh, kick drum strokes myself. And the, uh, try to keep them uh, a little as modern uh, metal music like it to be. Uh, they're still, uh, it still feels uh, like they're played, um, which in itself is kind of difficult. Um, so uh, I've spent a lot of hours editing the kick drums and uh, when I was finished with that and started to working on the vocals and the lyrics, um, I had a lot of back and forth with Aldran, uh, Bjorn Denker, uh, and um, I wanted to like write the lyrics together with him and work close with him uh, back and forth to, to get what I wanted, but uh, um, that's not very comfortable for him. Uh, he likes to deliver and get it finished and uh, uh, he, he uh, didn't like all this back and forth um, uh, communications, so he said, uh, like, yeah, you should do the lyrics yourself, you write good lyrics, so why don't you just write all the lyrics and uh, I had to do that. And uh, lyric work for me was kind of um, um, unfamiliar or uh, I didn't uh, feel comfortable with the writing uh, lyrics. So that was uh, something for me to learn. And uh, it took some years. <laughs> but uh, today I feel m much more comfortable and happy with the writing lyrics. And also with the, I had to do a lot of uh, demoing along uh, the way just to check if, okay, does this work with the music? And I started with like uh, talking the lyrics into the songs. Um, and uh, that didn't feel too good, so I had to like start uh, singing them properly. And after a while, I started uh, to feel that okay, I can do proper vocals myself. So uh, it ended up with me writing um, uh, all, almost all the lyrics. Uh, and uh, also uh, Bjorn has done uh, his recordings uh, and um, uh, on some songs I think that I perform better than him. So I'll uh, do some songs myself and Sigurd will do one song on this album. Uh, yes. uh, and the material is uh, very varied, I hope. Um, we had an idea in the start that we should only have uh, guitars, bass, drums, and vocals, no synthesizers, no, no uh, samples, and no like uh, industrial elements, just to uh, keep it different from the previous record, which a lot of people find industrial. Um, and uh, after uh, uh, I demoed all the vocals and started to listen through the whole album, I kind of felt like uh, this is tiring shit. Uh, it's uh, a little too much. Uh, it's a lot of uh, fast and aggressive drums, uh, but um, it feels a little static. So um, I used one of uh, Satyricon's um, uh, uh, collaborators uh, who they use a lot in uh, in uh, recording and in studio, uh, a guy called uh, Erik Junggren, uh, who is located in Oslo, who has a doctor's degree in analog synthesizers and also um, um, is a lecturer on, uh, in a music uh, academy in Oslo. So he has really, uh, uh, really a competent uh, a musician and producer. He has worked with AHA and uh, Segman and a lot of uh, big names. And uh, um, after uh, listening uh, together with Sigur at the whole album, uh, <laughs> we, he kind of put his finger on the problem. He said, uh, yeah, all the drums are like... All the time, Snurja. 
if you want to have any dynamics uh, in this album, you should like uh, take off uh, out some drums here and there and uh, make it more um, dynamic. And I uh, proposed that I used Eric to help me with that because uh, for me the album was kind of blinding. I uh, like had it too much in my under my skin, so it was really nice to to give it to him and make. Uh, him like try to make it more dynamic and I had some ideas he had some ideas and we worked together uh, for a week or two in his studio and um, took out some drums replaced them with uh, analog drum machines and uh, used synthesizers to like spice up the album and uh, after that process I felt that the album was, was twice as good um, and the songs are like, uh, they're pretty much uh, aggressive and uh, uh, airy and tornsy, but uh, they're also, I like to keep things short. I don't like uh, long uh, symphonic uh, things that never end, stuff like that. Uh, I don't have the attention span for it. So uh, the whole album is just over half an hour. Uh, but you really feel like you've gone through a long journey when uh, listening through uh, all of it. So uh, now it's just um, uh, the last vocal uh, parts left, uh, which I'm doing these days. Um, and, um, and we have to mix it and uh, then hopefully we can get it released. And I'm pretty mm -hmm. confident that uh, people will uh, like his like this album just as much or even more than the previous one. I think this one is much better. So um, it has like uh, promising. Yeah, it has very hard uh, tornsy stuff, and it has uh, some atmospheric elements and um, and a lot of different songs. Uh, they're kind of catchy and good songs, I think. And uh, I think the vocals and lyrics are uh, kind of uh, uh, in your eye. Uh, it's uh, I try to stay away from what I call like Dungeons and Dragons uh, lyrics. I want them to be more uh, real, uh, more uh, uh, down to earth, more like streetwise stuff. So mm. I, I think uh, a lot of uh, people will first like uh, stagger at it or uh, think that uh, this might be a little cringe, but then uh, mm -hmm. see the darker aspect that lies under it and hopefully learn to love it. Okay. Okay, I think we, we went through. Uh most essential aspects of uh, of your work. Uh, so I don't know if you have any final remarks, any comment, anything you want to say to our listeners? Um, just that uh, uh, make music, it's really fun, it's really healthy, and uh, it's a good uh, place to put your frustrations or aggressions or anything, just uh, start working on an instrument or a computer or a synthesizer or anything that you have to, to create something, build something. Uh, yeah. Building stuff is a good tool against uh, uh, depression or uh, frustration or anything. As soon as your brain starts to, to to look forward instead of backward, uh, you get in a better mood. And uh, uh, if you shout or you play or you drum or you uh, tweak, it's like uh, uh, really healthy, I think. Um, so that's my advice to people who love music is to, to try to make something. And it doesn't have to have uh, large ambitions and it, uh, uh, it's just fun to, to do. Um, I've also started a YouTube channel uh, mm -hmm. called uh, something like Snurja's School of Desktop Satanism and mm -hmm. uh, just uh, try to give a different approach to making music and uh, 
I try to show off some of the things I've been doing and to maybe inspire people to, to make their own music because uh, and also uh, to show that uh, you don't need to, to follow the guidelines. You can like uh, make something on your own that's equally relevant. Um, as long as you like it yourself, it's prop. Uh, it's a big chance that someone else will uh, appreciate uh, that you have made something, and uh, maybe they even listen to it often. Uh, so, mm -hmm. uh, I think the um, uh, the threshold for uh, for uh, doing that is too high. Uh, not everyone, but um, many more people than you think could make their own music and make something good. If you just have some simple gear, uh, you don't need a supercomputer or uh, expensive stuff to make good music. You just need to be able to record uh, anything. Okay, uh, Snuri, thank you again for for uh, this interview. Thank you too, it's been really nice. So, uh, nice. hope I, uh, <laughs> I answered your questions good and uh, uh, that the listeners will appreciate listening to some of this. Mm -hmm.